Hey everyone, Matt Brunig here. I got this question from Jonathan. He asks, Matt, why and how does Norway have the highest electric and plug-in hybrid vehicle ownership rates in the world? Luckily for Jonathan, I have been doing some work on this recently, and so I have the answers very much uh, ready at hand. So let's just hop right into it and try to make this a quicker one than I usually do. So the data for uh, electric vehicle sales in Norway comes from this organization, OVF, which is basically like the car lobby in Norway. Um, they just put out the report for December 2022, which also gives us, therefore, the annual figures for 2022. And what we see in December 2022 is that 79.3% of all new cars that were sold in uh, Norway, technically registered in Norway, were 79. electric vehicles were 79.3% of all new cars sold. And if you notice, if you click here, you can actually go for every month and every year. It goes back and back and back and back. And if you do that and you compile it into a spreadsheet, you get this lovely vehicle. So here we see the percent of new vehicles that are zero emission vehicles. So the commenter also asked about plug-in hybrids. They're really moving away from hybrids, period. They don't want hybrids. They want zero emission vehicles, full electric vehicles. So this is only zero emission vehicles. Starting in 2011, only 1% of the new cars that were sold in Norway were electric vehicles. And then we just go up and up and up and up and up. So that last year was all the way up to 79%. Look, it's jumping 11 percentage points and then 14 percentage points. I mean, if it jumps another 14 percentage points, we're going to be up into the 93% range. Uh, the government has set a target uh, for all 100% of new vehicle sales to be zero emission vehicles by 2025. And they seem to be right on, on track for doing that. So how do they accomplish this? Basically three things, and I'll, and I'll show you some sources and stats and interesting calculations uh, related to these three, three things, right? Number one is heavy taxes on uh, internal combustion engine vehicles, ICE vehicles, right? Your normal gasoline uh, guzzling vehicles. Heavy taxes on those. Two, subsidies for electric vehicles. And then three, building out infrastructure that enables people to drive around with electric vehicles, uh, i.e. charging stations, things like that, right? So, you know, I mean, it's pretty straightforward, right? You want to make it so that uh, it's a smart move financially to buy electric vehicles. So raise the price of ICE vehicles, lower the price of EV vehicles, make that uh, the delta between the two as big as you can, and then also make sure that it's practical to own one of these cars by setting up charging stations. That's the short of it. But what are the specific details? So in Norway... Um, when you buy a car, you are subject to three or four taxes, depending on exactly how you want to look at it. So this is from uh, their very latest budget document in Norway. And they actually changed things a little bit um, this year um, when it comes to the taxation of these cars. But this is the, the, essentially what they're trying to do this year to implement new tax policy. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a useful guide of what they've generally done, right? So you have a one-off registration tax on vehicles. So this is, this is the stuff that's applied at the point of purchase. Um, and the first tax is called, uh, well, I don't know what it's called, but here it's, it's described as curb weight. They spell curb, K-E-R-B. Here we spell it C-U-R-B, even though this is English translation. I don't know. They didn't get that one translated to to English for us. Uh, I don't know, maybe other people use curb uh, and spell it that way in other English speaking countries. Anyways, that's the one they, they tax you based on the weight of the vehicle. And this is kind of just seen as like the normal tax. And up until this year, um, the weight tax was not applied to electric vehicles at all. This year, they're actually going to apply a small weight tax to electric vehicles. But going back, you know, 10, 15 years, the last 10, 15 years, you didn't pay this tax for an electric vehicle, but you did pay it for um, internal combustion uh, vehicles, ICE vehicles. Um, and as you can see, it's actually a progressive weight tax. So the first 500 kilograms of weight, you don't pay any tax. And then the next 700 kilograms of weight, this is the weight of the car. You pay this many kroners per kilogram and so on, right? So it's a marginal tax rate. 
So you got the weight tax. The second thing is you have the nitrous oxide emissions tax. And every car, you know, the manufacturer basically has to report, this is how many milligrams of nitrous oxide our car is going to emit per kilometer that it's driven. And then they assess a tax. This is uh, their currency. So a certain amount of kroner here. Last year it was 78 kroner. 78 kroner per milligram per kilogram or per kilometer emitted of nitrous oxide. And then we have uh, the carbon emissions, which is the same basic idea, right? Every car, the manufacturer is going to say, yeah, our car is going to emit a certain a number of grams of, of carbon dioxide per kilometer driven, and then they apply a progressive tax rate to that. So those are the three big taxes. The other uh, tax is the value-added tax. This is like a general sales tax that's applied to pretty much everything you buy in Norway. So it's not really a car-specific tax. Um, because you pay it on candy bars, you pay it on, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, but it's notable because uh, for a lot of this period, and this is starting to change a little bit recently, um, electric vehicles were uh, exempt from the VAT, from the value-added tax. So if you bought an ICE vehicle, you would pay a 25% tax. That's just like 25% of the price of the car. If you bought an electric vehicle, you wouldn't pay that. So what did this all look like? Uh, put together. Um, so let's start with the weight tax. This is just a little graph I put together of, the, of how the weight tax works here. So we take the curb weight of the car and then you can kind of zoom up here. So let's say your car weighs 5,000 pounds. Um, then you're going to pay whatever this is, $28,000. And this is where a lot of trucks in the United States are weighing in these days. So that's a $28,000 tax uh, just on the weight of the car. As you can see in 2023 for electric vehicles, they are actually charging a weight tax. They did not do that last year or any of the years before. So this is a brand new thing. But even as they're introducing this weight tax on electric vehicles, you can see they're, they're charging way less. So huge difference there. The carbon tax, same kind of thing here. So here's CO2 emissions grams per mile. I've translated all this into dollars using exchange rates and I've, tr I've translated into imperial units. Uh, but yeah, so this is, you know, how many grams of carbon dioxide you're going to emit per mile and then they charge this tax here. So uh, I think the average car, and we'll get to this in a minute in the US right now, is emitting about 340 grams per mile. So you can see the tax is going to be you know, in the mid 20,000 range. And this is a one-off tax you're going to pay when you're buying the car. And then for nitrous, uh, nit I keep saying, did I say nitrous oxide? <laughs> Nitrogen oxides, it's not like uh, the stuff you push in video games to make your car go uh, faster. For nitrogen oxides, you pay um, $12.67 per milligram per mile of projected nit nitrogen oxide emissions. Anyways, the average light duty vehicle in the U.S. emits 157 milligrams per mile for um, NOx, and so the average tax on that would be just under $2,000. Um, anyway, so we can put this all together for kind of an average vehicle in the U.S. to get a sense of what this would look like. Um, so for, for car price, I get 4,700, 47,000. I just take this from car and driver magazine, right? So to that, we apply a 25% tax cause they have a VAT tax in the U S now. I don't know how perfect this is. I'm just kind of giving you an illustration. So don't come at me on like little narrow, uh, you know, nitpicks about, well, that 47,000 actually does include some tax. And so it wouldn't be part of the VAT base. I'm not interested in that right now. So we take the 47,000 average sale price, we multiply it by 25%. That's just the VAT tax on the car. The next thing we have is weight. As we can see here, this is from the EPA. They're saying, you know, this is one of their most recent documents they put out last year. The average weight of a car, 4,156 pounds. So I take that 4,156 pounds. I use this progressive tax rate here you know, um, that I showed you earlier, and we put that together, and that's $16,650 tax just on the weight of the vehicle for uh, NOx emissions, like I said already, just under $2,000 tax for CO2 emissions. Uh, for that, we got uh, this from um, 
The energy department, they're saying 348 grams per mile is an average for a light duty vehicle purchased in the U.S., so that's $27,000. We add it all up, and the taxes on, an, on the average ICE vehicle that's purchased in the U.S. right now would be $57,000 in Norway on top of the sales price. So, I mean, you're getting into six figs buying a car. Now, this is slightly, I won't say this is slightly misleading, but part of the point of these taxes is to encourage people, even people who are buying ICE cars, I suppose, to buy cars that have lower NOx emissions, that have lower CO2 emissions, and that have lower weights, right? So if these taxes were actually imposed in the U.S., a lot of people would switch to electric vehicles, of course, but even the ones that didn't, they would probably buy way lighter cars and they would buy cars that had you know, less NOx emissions and less CO2 emissions. So the amount of tax that you're actually paying for the average car would not be 57000 because people would just buy much different cars. But that would be you know, if you didn't change your behavior at all. So as you can see, big incentive to stop buying ICE vehicles and certainly to stop buying big, heavy, highly em emissions dense, is that a word, uh, vehicles, okay? On the uh, EV incentives side of things, well, first off, you're not paying any of this until very recently. You didn't even pay the VAT tax, which is this one. They changed that this year. They're not going to make you pay the full VAT tax on electric vehicles, but they're going to make you pay a little bit of it. But you're not paying this, you're not paying this, you're not paying this, and until recently you're not paying this. So you're saving 57000 on taxes by going to uh, electric vehicles. But then they've got stuff on top of that here. So this is just a list of... Uh, Norwegian electric vehicle incentives that I, th I found very useful, nice, well-assembled um, kind of thing. I've gone over some of this already. Um, so there's no purchase tax. There was an exemption on the VAT, which is a general sales tax. Um, it's explaining here there will be a VAT tax next year, but it's going to be a partial VAT tax. They didn't have to pay an annual road tax, um, which I guess, you know, you pay like an annual property-style tax on your vehicle in Norway. Uh, toll. Tolls were free, no tolls for electric vehicles. If you ride a ferry, a lot of ferries in Norway, it's a very maritime country. You put your electric vehicle on a ferry for at least these eight years, you weren't paying anything to get on a ferry. For these uh, 20 years, you weren't paying anything on the toll roads. Um, now you pay reduced ferry fares and reduced toll roads, right? 50% and, and 70% or whatever, right? So for 18 plus years, you had free municipal parking. So if you were going to a municipal parking lot, you had an EV, you didn't have to pay for that. Um, and on and on from here. I guess those are the big ones. So free tolls, free ferries, free parking, don't have to pay the VAT, don't have to pay the annual road tax. And this is all on top of the fact that you don't have to pay any of this. So as you see, the the financial gap between the two is huge it's massive right but and this is the last piece of the puzzle it doesn't matter how much more uh how, how much cheaper the electric vehicles are to buy if you can't practically operate them because you don't have charging stations and whatever to work with um then that's not going to help you either right you got to be able to actually charge the damn thing to run them so They've had a policy there of really, really focusing on building charging stations. This is from, <laughs> this is unsourced Statista. You know, I wish I could get you a better source on this, but it's the best I could find quickly here. So as you can see, in 2011, they only had, you know, 3,100 charging stations. Just 10 years later, they had 20,000 charging stations. This is a country that has uh, five and a half uh, million people in it. So, you know. It's a lot. I think, the, you know, in terms of density, they have more charging stations like per capita than any country in the world. And a lot of these charging stations were actually public charging stations. So you saw this, especially in cities like Oslo had free public chargers just built all over the city. There were like over a thousand of them um, in, in the capital there. Um, that's changed recently. And I guess that's one of the other notable things here, I guess, just in general is, you know, 
you set a goal, you set a target, which is to eventually get everyone buying zero emission vehicles by 2025 is the goal now. And you, there's a lot of tweaking going on, right? Like they didn't charge for toll roads and now they do. They didn't charge for ferries and now they do, but it's a reduced amount. They didn't do the VAT, but then they started charging the VAT. They had free municipal parking for a while, but then that didn't make sense. With the free public chargers, one of the things they figured out was that people would use the fact that you could you could charge your car for free in like on Oslo streets with free public chargers they would use those to just park their cars in front of the chargers and just use that as like a parking spot even though they weren't charging it and so they realized that didn't really that didn't really serve the purpose because now all the chargers are clogged up we want the chargers to be open so people can actually charge their cars on them but people are using them as free parking and so they actually implemented a charge that would basically get people in and out of those charging stations instead of using them as parking. So it's a lot of, like in that case, you know, it's a good example of just kind of tinkering your way to where you're trying to go. Um, and I think that's maybe in general a highly underrated aspect of these uh, countries. If you follow them for many years, and I have uh, now, and then even sort of look in your history, everything's changing all the time, right? They're making little tweaks here. We're going to increase this benefit a little bit. We're going to change this one a little bit. Uh, the unemployment system needs to be modified at the moment because we have this problem over here, right? So it's not like you, you nail one policy and here it is and everyone, you know, it's, it's, it's an effort to actually achieve something. And if you want to achieve something, you can keep turning the dials until you achieve it. Um, and that's, I think, what you see you see here. But aside from that general point, what do we see? Number one, tax the hell out of ICE vehicles. Number two, provide subsidies to electric vehicles, both in the form of not taxing them, but also here, free tolls, free ferries, all these kinds of things that just make it a lot cheaper to own an electric vehicle. And number three, make sure you have the uh, electric vehicle infrastructure that's actually needed, most specifically charging stations. Put those three things together, and it seems like you could get where Norway needs to get. I guess I should put one last caveat on the on the end here. Obviously, Norway is a small country, so in a way, you know, it's easy for them to swap out their um, their vehicle fleet with electric vehicles because their vehicle fleet is not that large, like as a percent of of the global economy, right? Of of as a percent of the global vehicle fleet. Right. So a little bitty country could just buy all the electric vehicles that are coming off the assembly lines and they could quickly, uh, you know, fix their fleet. Whereas a big country like the U.S., you couldn't, you know, I mean, you're going to have to ramp up vehicle production. Right. Norway didn't really have to ramp up vehicle production. I don't even know that they have any EV vehicle producers in Norway. I think it's mostly imported from from elsewhere. Um but if you're going to swap out a vehicle fleet as far as big as the U.S. is, that's going to require you to actually go mine a ton of lithium and actually build a bunch of infrastructure, actually construct these vehicles. So an industrial policy. Norway didn't really have to do an electric vehicle production industrial policy because it's a small little country and it could just buy up all the like little Teslas and you know, the EVs coming out of Volkswagen and stuff like that. It could just kind of do that. It made sense for them to do that. But um, for a larger country, you also are going to need to pair it with industrial policy that actually makes it so that you can get these things off the uh, assembly lines in, in mass, you know. Um, so I guess I would add that to that prong number four <laughs> in EV industrial policy, um, which Norway w does not provide guidance on. So there you have it. It's It's, you know, it's... Not too mysterious, pretty straightforward, um, and, and hopefully we'll follow suit uh, here in the U.S. and really across the world because, you know, obviously this is one of the big puzzle pieces to uh, getting to a, a carbon-free future.